For once, Martin Devlin reckons a barrage of criticism against New Zealand rugby recently wasn't justified. To explain this shock, disgraceful U-turn, I'm just joined by Martin to discuss this week's Playing the Ball column. Martin, it's the use of this sort of language which has got you riled up in the first place. What have you written about this week? Yeah, look, this happened a couple of weeks ago, Hamish. Um, thank you again. And before I might say anything else, what about them black ferns, huh? Um, this was about the quarterfinal clash between, uh, and when I say the clash, it wasn't anything that was happening on the field, it was actually happening off the field, and it was the scheduling botch up, which New Zealand rugby admitted, you know, that they had cocked up, and that was, um, you know, the scheduling of the All Blacks test match in Japan, which happened to clash and coincide with the Black Ferns quarterfinal in the World Cup against Wales. Um, and the overreaction, the hysterical reaction from the New Zealand media, the New Zealand sports media, and the four major news websites it is embarrassing for all of them, for everyone that is involved in writing these stories, especially for the editors. You know, and, and part of the column that I write about, I mean, you're a journalist and have been for a long time. I'm not actually officially a journalist, so I'm not qualified for that. I've been, you know, in the media uh, working in the same field for a very long time. I, I hadn't really seen anything like it to that extent. Um, and, you know, and I don't use the word hysterical lightly, but, you know, a lot of these people need to give themselves a slap and a hard slap. You know, when you start, you know, it, probably, you know, the thing that got me the most was when the Justice Minister, Kitty Allen, climbed in and um, called it disgraceful. I mean, what a word to use. You know, when you look at what is happening in this country here, and I cite, you know, the fact that we maim, torture, burn, mutilate a child every two weeks in this country, our caregivers do it, our parents do it to their own children. When you look at those kind of figures, the domestic violence figures, the rampant crime, the street crime, the ram raids, everything else, I mean, come on, Justice Minister. A scheduling botch-up for two rugby teams playing at the same time is hardly disgraceful, is it? And this kind of over-emotive language, and, I mean, I, I do question, I really do question, Hamish, I don't know where you trained um, as a journalist, but I do wonder, and I'd love to sit down with a lot of these young people that are working these websites and being told by these editors, you know, what to write and the kind of language to use, whether or not you got it, is this really what you got into the industry to do? Because if you, I was asking you today and you were asking me today, if that's what you were getting into the industry to do today, I wouldn't be working in this business. There's no question about it. I laugh at it, I mock at it, I scoff at it, I sneer at it. It was a uh, it was a valid question to ask, though, don't you think, of New Zealand rugby? It does appear to at least have been pretty clumsy in, in the scheduling box. It right? was clumsy. Yeah, sure, it was clumsy. You know, and and they should do better. But, you know, when you actually, you know, listen to the comments from the Black Friends coach, Wayne Smith, who was obviously bombarded with this at the press conferences and the players who were bombarded with this before that quarterfinal, it was not something that they cared about or considered. They had bigger things on their mind. And they, as Wayne Smith said, they stuffed up. Yeah, they did stuff up. They made a mistake. You know, people make mistakes. You know, guess what? The 660 concert was scheduled for the same time on a Saturday night in Wellington's Cape Town. How dare that misogynist, anti-woman, bunch of haters schedule a concert at the same time as a rugby test played by women. I mean, this is how ridiculous and silly it is, isn't it? Sure, you know, mock them as much as you want, and they admit they botched it up. But that's as serious as it actually gets. And guess what? After winning the semi-final this week, does anyone care? The answer's no. And the most disappointing thing for me is the clickety-clickety-click-click-clickbait you know, the, the fact that these people get paid by, you know, how many people click on their story, whether they read it or not, is, 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 is a crime against the word called journalism in this country. There was between four and five, five and six stories on these sports websites that were dedicated to that, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's just, it's, it's infantile and it's childish. And, you know, I might be the only one here howling at the moment, but I think these things are really important. You know, I, you work in a profession and I work in the same profession where, you know, there's meant to be a degree of integrity about it. You know, what you put out there, you're actually meant to have some kind of belief in what you do. And to have to see that so just so wantonly and brazenly stripped away for the sake of making a few ridiculous headlines. I mean, News Hub, News Hub wrote that it caused a national uproar. I don't know about you, Hamish. You live in Pukekoi. How many people were uproaring about it in the streets of Pukekoi? You went to the supermarket. Were people yelling and screaming about it, were they? Did it stop the place, did it? No, it didn't. No. It's a media beat up, probably the worst I've seen in recent times. Let's focus on the rugby for a second, though. What's your pick for the final? Do you think they can get up and do it? 
Look, I put my hand up on Friday home and I said, I'm going to be the most hated man in the country right now. I thought that France would beat us. And, you know, part of the part of the reason I said that is because, again, with the mass media, there is no actual analysing of these two teams. There's no breakdown of these two teams. What did you know about those French women? Not a lot. What did you no. know about? No. And if you read the mass media sites, what did you glean about how good they are, who are the best players, who are the key players, how they would play the game? I mean, I had to go completely outside. Oh, sorry, excuse me, outside of you know any of the mass media websites to find this. I interviewed um, and have had on the program Melody Robinson every week. Now, Mel's a two-time winner and is absolutely brilliant at breaking down these teams. I thought that France, and let's be honest about it, it was bum squeakingly close at the end there. Mm, it was mm. a 35-meter penalty. Um, but that, you know, I had, a, you know, any New Zealand rugby fan, if you're watching the men or the women play, that feels safe playing France in a World Cup. Well, obviously, you don't know your history. And, you know, it was that tight and that tense. I think what has happened is glorious. It's, it's you know, the word is organically, and that's how it's grown. And I've written a number of columns about this, about stop yelling at us and telling us off and demanding that we watch. People have gravitated towards it because it is worth watching. Now, some of the games haven't been. Most of the games in the Women's Rugby World Cup haven't been. But that particular game on the weekend, that semi-final, was as good a sport as you would see. Yeah, that was seriously. It was seriously entertaining. And look, I've been to Eden Park a lot, probably like you have, Hayman, like a lot of people who are watching this have probably been. To watch an all-black test at Eden Park is not a fun experience. It's a sombre, moody, miserable experience where most people moan. Um, the semi-final in 2011 when we beat Australia was the first time ever that I walked out of Eden Park with the place jumping like a rock concert. I didn't go on the weekend. I've been in Wellington. Um, and But you could feel it through the TV, the energy and the buzz from that crowd. It looked fun. Didn't it look fun? Are you going to and, the final? Well, I'm trying to obviously scrounge myself a ticket at the moment. Look, if not, I'll be watching it in the pub in Kingston like most people will. Um but that's the whole point of sport. It's meant to be something that actually is emotive and fun and provides sort of memories forever. You're not meant to stomp out of the stadium and go, we didn't play well and they didn't play well and the coaches now. You know, there's just something about that that if you can't if you can't feel something from the river of emotions that you were riding, it was like going through the rapids on one of those white water rafts or something, wasn't it? Right to the very end. That's what sport's meant to do for us. It's meant to take us up. It's meant to bring us down. It's meant to leave us wrought at the end of it. I don't know whether we beat England. I think Wayne Smith, assuming the underdog tag, is actually a really realistic way of looking at it. They were a thoroughly, fully professional side. They weren't that impressive against Canada. But the sheer tightness, tautness, and tension of a final with everything on it and a big crowd supporting the home team, maybe that might be the key that gets our women across the line. You know, I don't want to put the Devlin curse and the Devlin mocker on them, so I won't pick a score for you. Martin, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Hamish.